thank you, Tom, for this humbling introduction. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for being here. So, teaching robots to see. Um, I hope you agree that uh, in nature we have some stunning examples of great visual perception and coordination skills, like this one here. So, you can see a swarm of birds flying together without crashing into each other, actually flying in a formation, so coordinating to, um, to fly this way. And so, if we really want to have autonomous robots able to operate in our uh, environments, we need them to understand and be aware of their workspace in somehow a similar manner. So it is for this reason that um, we aim to teach robots to see. Now, you might wonder why do we focus on seeing out of all of our senses? Well, there is this saying that one picture is a thousand words, and this is to convey the fact that images um, contain a lot of information, a lot of information, and actually vision is our most powerful sense in understanding, in sensing, um, and helping us how to navigate and interact with our environment. So the idea in our work is to teach robots to see in a bit to boost their intelligence. Now, there are many tasks out there where automation can make a real difference. Whether you want to digitize uh, an archaeological structure, you'd like to have a robotic team to help you with search and rescue, um, inspect a power plant or monitor crops, then computer vision and robotics have a lot to offer and can have a great impact. Now, the marriage of these two disciplines has drawn quite some attention, I'd say the last uh, couple of decades or so, um, due to some key advancements. For example, SLAM. So here is uh, MonoSlam in action. This, is, this was the first system that demonstrated that it is possible to track the motion of a single camera while it is moving in real time. So you can see the kind of maps, uh, the sparse um, patch maps that MonoSlam was able to build. And since then, so this was an open source system, and since then we've had quite a few systems that came up, um, also keyframe-based systems, PTAM you might have heard of, um, that came up and shook the ground uh, uh, of computer vision and robotics. Now, it wasn't long before people started to port such systems onboard their robots, like in this example here, where you can see a drone uh, that has a downward-looking camera. And um, using the downward-looking camera, it's running PTAM. Um, in, a, in a second, you'll see the features that get picked up to start reasoning about how the camera is moving and how the robot is moving. And I'd like to draw your attention to this cable here. I don't know if the people in the back can see it, but there's a cable connecting the uh, drone to a ground station. Why? Because that's where all the data was streamed at the time to be processed. So obviously this, not, this was not a system that was able to get out of the laboratory environment and perform in any of the, t of the tasks that I mentioned earlier. But um, by the end of the project, we managed to have all of the computation on board. We cheated a little bit. We had also a bigger drone. Um, but what you are looking at here is visual inertial uh, SLAM. So it's based on PTAM. You can see the keyframes that are being created and the key points and some of the keyframes that get forgotten towards the end of, of the robot's trajectory because we cannot keep track of everything. And this was the first time that um, we were able to demonstrate that we can control vision-based flights uh, of such small aircraft in such scenarios. Um, we were very proud of this, but I have to say that the backstage of all of this was that every time we had to run a demo, we had to go to the site two days in advance to make sure that everything runs properly, um, internet, weather conditions, illumination conditions, everything. So, teaching robots to see, are we there yet? Well, I guess you know the answer. So, what do we need? We need faster motion, we need larger maps, we need richer maps. We need more robust algorithms, and at the same time, we need them to consume less computation. So we need a little bit of everything. So if I am to summarize all of these points in one, we actually need to handle larger amounts of data more effectively. And in robotics, in contrast to computer vision, we constantly have to balance out these competing goals of precision versus efficiency. And um, now, from teaching robots to see, to teaching drones to see, we have some additional properties and challenges to consider. 
We like to work with drones because they're lightweight and safer than larger robots, so we're happy for our students to get, uh, to, for them to be that robot that they work with. Um, but that also means that we have limited resources on board. So we cannot really carry the same um, number of uh, sensors and the same computational units that you can carry on a car. We love to work with drones because they're fast and agile. They can really gain the overview of the scene in seconds. But in order to be able to use this um, agility and fast motion, we also need fast algorithms to be able to track this motion. So in contrast to ground robots, a drone cannot really stop and wait for an algorithm to complete. So stopping means switching your propellers off and falling on the ground, if not crashing into something or someone. And if we are to talk about autonomy, we need to acknowledge that battery is a scarce resource and that communication bandwidth is not to be relied upon. So it is for this reason that we typically try to have all the flight critical tasks run on board the drone itself. So our vision at the Vision for Robotics Lab is the following. We would like to have a team of robots, let's say small aircraft, that they are equipped with cameras. And we would like to develop their visual perception and intelligence that will enable them to navigate autonomously as individuals, first of all, and then collaborate in a team to perform a task, for example, to um, build a map of their workspace. Now, as drones pose some of the most difficult challenges for vision-based perception, we argue that if we are able to um, develop these capabilities for drones, then their extension to other kinds of platforms can be rather straightforward. But before we are able to realize this challenge, uh, well, this uh, vision, we have three main challenges to address. So I'm going to go through them and also describe our latest work um, on our quest towards achieving them. So some of these works are also presented in this ICRA. So first of all, we would like to have robust localization and mapping. So we'd like to have robust SLAM. We would uh, like to have robustification against common issues such as changing weather conditions or changing lighting conditions, as otherwise our robots can really get lost, as you'll see in that video there. And I'm sure many of you roboticists uh, can very much relate to robots uh, failing. Um, so one way we're dealing with this is via sensor fusion. So here you're looking at a drone that is fusing fusing visual, inertial, and GPS information to come up with a more refined estimate of the area that the drone is monitoring at each instant. So here we are int introducing this local frame in order to keep track of the local drift of the pose estimation that's happening. And then at runtime, we continuously try and optimize this transformation between the coordinate systems or the local and the global coordinate systems. And this gives us um, stable um, pose estimation for our drone. Now, GPS is not always available or reliable. For example, indoors, on Mars, or in narrow streets like this one in downtown Zurich. So here you are looking at um, the, the video stream of a robot that is uh, moving down a straight street in Zurich, is uh, um, estimating visual inertial slam. You can see the trajectory of the robot being estimated in red, and uh, the robot is also estimating a map of the environment. But it quickly becomes evident that um, there's drift and so these estimates deviate from reality. So it is in these cases that we need to run um, loop closure detection or place recognition um, to essentially recognize when the robot visits a location that it has visited before, but sequential SLAM wasn't able to recover that. So we usually do this by building um, a vocabulary of visual words. Um, and then searching for matching images across the robot's trajectory uh, in a very similar way that we are querying images in, in Google. Now, problems arise when uh, different places can appear to be the same. And the same place can actually appear to be different between runs. And that's even more emphasized when you consider the axis of time. So different seasons or different times of day. 
And on top of that, if you're actually navigating the scene with a small aircraft, you actually can um, experience the same scene from very different viewpoints, which adds on to the challenge of recognizing this place based on visual cues. So at the moment, we don't have one um, killer all system that is able to deal with all of these problems at the same time. So what we do is we break this in more manageable challenges and we try to deal with one problem at a time. Um, so one way we're trying to deal with viewpoint tolerance is by transforming our current view into an orthophoto. So this is essentially an imagination of what that place would look like from an upright view. So how do we do this? Well, we have SLAM that's running anyway while the robot is moving, and we're using the map that SLAM is building to come up with the most dominant plane in the current view, and then we project all of the pixels of the current view to that plane, and that's the orthophoto. So why is this interesting? Well, because at runtime, when you keep doing that with your database and you compare orthophotos instead of the original views, then you create a much better posed problem for your feature matching. Um, now, of course, that work had a bit of a problem in the sense of assuming that we have a dominant plane in the scene. So, at that, at the, in this ICRA, we try to relax this assumption by going back and thinking, well, we have SLAM that is running anyway. So we know that um, we can have for sure appearance matches because we extract features. But on top of that, we don't only have appearance information. We can actually have some geometric information about these features. So we have both 3D information about the relative constellation of features and also 2D geometric information about how these features project in our images. So in this work, we try to also use this geometric signature of a place on top of its appearance signature. And here you can see a little bit of the system in action. So actually, we went back to exactly the same street a few months later. Um, so we have different times of day, actually here, different lighting conditions. Um, some stores have even changed their logo, so this was adding on to the perceptual aliasing. We have pedestrians moving along, so we're not able to detect every loop. But um, this system, we show that we were able to achieve better recall for perfect precision with respect to um, the state-of-the-art methods. Now, in order to actually deal with illumination, so here we haven't really uh, explicitly dealt with illumination problems, but in order to deal with this, um, today we are resorting to deep learning techniques. So um, we've taken lots and lots of webcam data, uh, years of stationary webcam data that have been really capturing exactly the same place over and over again. So our CNN uh, was able to learn the variations of a scene through time and seasons. And then this is now what you see in action where we are querying that system with new image and it's able to recover a matching image if it exists from the database, despite the fact that it might be captured in a different time of day, year, etc. Now, when I saw these results, I was excited for the performance, um, but I also was disappointed um, because I'm a handcrafted feature person and I was really uh, disappointed that deep learning beats us so easily. Um, so, I was comforted to also see some of the failure cases that I'd like to share with you. So not all matches are correct. So here you can see the query image, the ground truth, and our return. And we are showing the three top uh, matching regions between the query and the return uh, in, in matching colors. So you can see that this system now is picking out on cars and areas around cars which is obviously a bad idea. But why is this happening? Because our training data contains a lot of car images. And so um, the system really uh, learned that cars are important in an image, so, which was uh, obviously false. So on our quest to try and achieve robust SLAM, I've talked a little bit about experimenting with sensor fusion, place recognition, deep learning, and all this was to really give our robots the backbone of the awareness of space 
Okay, so to give a robot um, an estimate of its current pose, maybe some of the past poses as well, and a map of its surroundings. But the key word here is a sparse map, yeah? So this brings me to the second challenge where we would like to have effective scene reconstruction. So if we really want our robots to reach out and grasp an object or avoid obstacles while flying, then we need a more effective, a denser scene representation. So how useful would it be if we did have a drone that is intelligent enough to override the pilot's commands in cases where he or she is driving it into a wall. Something like semi-autonomous driving, but for drones. So what you're looking at here, we're not actually doing that, that's a dream, but what you're looking at here is dense uh, local scene reconstruction using a single camera. So how do we do that? Well, we run Orbslam on the background to keep track of how the robot is moving. And then we use, um, we perform stereo matching with some keyframes in the past, the current monocular frame with some keyframes in the past. And then because that map is super sparse still, we are actually tessellating the current view into super pixels to be able to know how to expand those first guesses to something a little bit denser to come up with basically a local scene estimate. But the question is, what kind of map do we really need? Well, I would argue that we need a global, accurate, dense reconstruction at any moment. Um, something like this. But this was captured with a laser scanner that Lucas went and put all around different places in this yard and then went back to his desk and ran ICP for some time to come up with this. And this is what we use for our ground truth. But actually, if you want to do obstacle avoidance, maybe you don't need something that this is so accurate. So based on this rationale, we said, let's again try and make the most of SLAM. It's working anyway, so let's try and isolate the most reliable features and mesh them out to come up, maybe not with a reconstruction, but with a denser scene estimation. Of course, it doesn't look very nice, but it's probably enough if you want to uh, navigate around obstacles, because you anyway need to have some clearance to these obstacles in case of wind gusts, for example. But if you really want to reach out and grasp an object, that's not enough. So for this reason, we started experimenting a little bit with the depth cameras. So here you're looking at a system that's using visual and inertial information to run SLAM, and then depth data to increment that map, um, which you will see in a second. This is the map we get with ground truth poses. And in a second, you will see the full uh, system in action. So here it is. It looks worse than before, of course. But here we're using SLAM poses and the depth uh, information that comes from a depth camera to reconstruct the very local scene. We argue that this is enough if you really want to manipulate an object. Most probably, it needs to be in your field of view. So this looks a little bit like a flashlight in the dark because anything that is three seconds away from my current camera pose expires. Uh, why? Because we don't have enough memory and we don't want to deal with drift. So um, dense estimation uh, is important also for uh, collision-free path planning. So in this case, you're looking at a drone that is given a task. We're saying, move towards somewhere here, outside your, the, the screen. Uh, so that acts as a magnet. Without knowing anything about the scene, the drone takes off. Well, after it takes off, it's run on autonomous mode, where it starts running SLAM, meshing out the scene, building up and updating a map of its workspace, and avoiding obstacles while this is uh, uh, this map is being built. So finally, the last uh, challenge that uh, we're aiming for is robot collaboration. So how can we get multiple drones um, to, well, in this case, two drones, to build a common map of their environment, for example? So here we have two drones that um, run SLAM, or visual odometry, if you want, monocular SLAM on board. And they use this data well, when they need to forget because the buffer is full, they dump this data down to a ground station, something like my laptop. And then that laptop is able to merge maps if necessary. So that's the red line that you see that's a place recognition instance. And um, here you can see the same system with four drones. 
But what's cool about it is that this server can also actually inform the agents and say, you know, maybe you're right now at a place where someone else has been to before. So here's the portion of the map that you need to localize against. Maybe you don't need to run Slam from scratch. The same system we've taken and also ported on a legged robot uh, together with a drone to collaboratively build a map of their environment using monocular cameras. Um, and actually since then we've also uh, extended this work to include um, inertial measurements as well in this collaborative visual inertial slam. And at this ICRA, um, we are presenting the back end, um, a version of the back end that led to this work. And I'll give you a very brief taste about it. So um, we have visually, visual inertial odometry now running on board each drone. So we run constantly bundle adjustment to refine that map. And if there is another drone present, then that's localizing against the existing map. And any points that they share between them, they act as a, a way of constraining the trajectories of the two drones and actually a way to collaborate, to perform collaborative SLAM. Now, the most common question I typically get is, why don't we use stereo? Uh, we use it, but not that often. I prefer mono. Why? First of all, every sensor adds new um, uh, calibration and synchronization issues. But more than that, um, if you port the stereo uh, camera on board a drone that's able to zoom in and out of a scene, then that baseline really quickly reduces to monocular if you're really far away from that scene. So we're saying, here's what you can do with collaboration. Take, instead of uh, a rigid mount of this stereo, have two drones, one camera on each drone, such that you can actually choose the baseline of, of uh, the, the best baseline for your scene. But before you're able to do that, you need to have some way of relative pose estimation. And if you're interested about this, you should quiz Marco on Thursday. Um, and if you're not convinced yet, about the power of collaboration, then I would encourage you to think about tasks that a single robot cannot do by itself, but a team can do. And here's an example from nature. So here you can see ants that are uh, creating a bridge between the two ends to transport members of uh, their colony from one side to the other. So it's something that one ant cannot do by itself, but a team can. And to broaden the horizon and also bring it back to robotics, think about um, a network relay of drones to um, essentially create a relay for Wi-Fi signal in a place where you want to inspect and there is no signal, or to um, share the load of an object to be transported. And um, to conclude, um, Basically, with these three challenges uh, that we're working on, um, we are aiming to deal with robotic perception and collaboration because we believe they're key to further progress. So giving robots this ability to see and work in a team, I believe has a great potential in revolutionizing the way that we use and consider robots today. And with this, I'd like to thank you. So you mentioned you were getting some very good results on place recognition with deep learning, um, but that you don't entirely trust it. What do you think the, the future will have in terms of opportunities for deep learning to play some role in these tasks without necessarily taking everything over? Yeah, well, I hope that we can still use some of um, our intelligence in feature-crafted, well, handcrafted methods to teach um, basically to tell our learning system what to learn. Um, so for the moment, the deep learning uh, work that I showed, for example, cannot really deal with viewpoint changes. Uh, we cannot port it on our drones because it's too expensive. So I'm hoping that there is some way to go by using some of our handcrafted intelligence 
in thinning down some of these networks to be able to actually perform faster and computationally less expensive. So it's the question related to the same topic, right? So your, the deep learning system was failing when the viewpoint changes, right? So have you tried instead of, so on the other hand, your manually extracted features were succeeding in those areas, right? Mm -hmm. So have you tried instead of only providing the raw pixels to the CNN, right? Which normally people do. So you provide the raw pixels as well as carefully selected manually, manual, manually extracted features and then rank them. Actually, ranked feature that these are the most important ones. Have you tried that? So rank them, how do you mean? Like teach them how to rank them? Yeah, but basically you have to provide a ranking that these are the, because when you extra, extract the manual uh, features, right, you know which are more, most important, right? You provide Yeah, them. ranking features manually to teach this uh, yes. system, though, it would be a very cumbersome task. So in this case, what you saw was a system that is able, was able to learn uh, salient regions by itself, but obviously, the data set that it was given with, it was provided with, was had lots of cars. So it learned that cars are salient. So yes, I agree with you in the sense that there should be some guidance in how you define what's salient for you. But um, I wouldn't go all the way to have manual labels of every single thing and ranking those features. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, when you have two or more drones and you want to fuse the maps together, do you fuse the sparse map or fuse dense map together? And do you consider any uncertainty involved in the map? I think uncertainty is very interesting. We don't consider yet any uncertainty, but I certainly think that it would be, certainly think it would be a good idea to think about uncertainty. Um, maybe one drone, for example, is in a place where there are not enough features, and if we had an idea of how uncertain its own pose is, maybe we would have some kind of relative weighting uh, in terms of using. Right now, we just blindly merge maps. And then you asked about sparse versus dense. So in our work so far, what I showed is basically sparse, okay? But if you are looking to do denser mapping, then I don't see why you couldn't. If, if you have a way to run loop closure detection using your dense maps, then it's the same system, essentially. Thank you very much.